Thank you, it's quite a privilege to be here today. I want to start with this picture here and see if anyone in this room, let's start with a, a show of hands, knows what this picture is depicting. Does anyone know what this is? This is the feeling that you have after you've left the couch with a clear idea in mind about what you wanted to get in the kitchen. You arrive there, look in the refrigerator, and have no idea what you're doing. Has anyone ever experienced this? Anyone in this room? Don't be shy. If you have, you could, you could share with us. How amazing is that? That our magnificent brains could let us down, that we could know exactly what we want, one single item, and just seven seconds later, we don't remember it. Clearly, we have the ability to remember a single item for seven seconds. How is that possible? How is it possible that our brains could fail us in that very easy task of just holding one thing in mind? The brain is the most remarkable structure that we are aware of. It's capable of incredibly rapid parallel processing, allowing us to interpret complex stimuli in our environment within a tenth of a second. Even computers, uh, which are designed to try to do these, have, have an inability to do that. Plus, we store a massive amount of information over the course of our lives. By some estimates, a, million, a billion bits of information. That's 50,000 times the text stored in the Library of Congress. Despite living in a rather small space, the brain is a massive structure having approximately 100 billion neurons. That's on the order of stars in the core of our Milky Way galaxy. What's even more impressive is that there are hundreds of trillions of connections between these neurons, creating a staggering network of very, very intricate complexity. But I don't have to tell you a lot of cool facts about the brain for you to realize how amazing it is. Every emotion you feel, every thought you have, every sensation you experience, every move you make, your very sense of identity, all emerges from the function of our brains. Despite that, the brain has some very distinct limitations. I'm going to talk about three of them. The first is attention. We know, just based on our experience and now an incredible amount of data, that we cannot distribute our attention everywhere, infinitely. We can selectively focus our attention, and that's what it's required to do that we direct our resources to what our goals are guiding us towards. Another limitation is something known as working memory. Working memory is online memory, not long-term memory. It's the memory used to guide your actions. It happens during a conversation to, to carry the thread of what's going on. It's also the type of memory that you use when, well, in the past, when someone gave you a phone number and then just send it to you, and you had to hold it in mind until you got it into the phone. We know that there are very strict limits on this capacity, and they decrease as information becomes more complex. Another limitation is speed. Although, as I described, our brains and certainly the neurons, if you look down at a high resolution, are capable of very rapid processing, because our brain functions as this massive network, when you have very complex operations, speed of all these areas communicating with each other becomes a limitation. So these three limitations on our brain's abilities leads to a sensitivity to interference. I'm going to describe what that is. We went and we asked folks when they had this experience, and almost everyone describes this, it increases as you get older, for those of you that have not noticed, you, uh, what happens? What led you to find your way to the kitchen with a clear idea in mind, and then when you got there, you just didn't know what you were doing? You could not remember what you were trying to get. And people describe in their best experience, what is happening. And we built a conceptual framework from this. And then we study in our lab. I'm a neuroscientist. We use tools to study how the brain functions and how that leads to higher order behaviors. So we built the framework based on people's anecdotes and experiences, and then tried to pursue it empirically and see if these were really mechanisms that influence behavior in the way people experience. So this is how the framework Goes. So we see that there's two types of interference, generally. Internal interference and externally induced interference. And we could split those each into different types of interference based on your goals. So if the information is totally irrelevant to you, we consider it a distraction. Let's say you're at a restaurant, you're having a conversation. If you have any hopes of remembering the details of that conversation, you know that you're very busy suppressing the chatter in the room, maybe the waiter is uh, t uh, taking an order at the next table. You're just trying to block that out. It's irrelevant information. You're trying to suppress it. That same stimuli can serve as what we call interruptions or multitasking, when you think that maybe you can do more than one thing at a time. So maybe you're sitting there having a conversation, but now you're trying to listen what the specials are being uh, uh, announced at the next table. Or maybe you're on the way to the refrigerator and a phone rings, and you pick it up, and now you have to re-engage in your initial task. That's how we split external interference. 
This can all happen internally as well. Some of it is mind wandering. Your thoughts leave your focus against your will, irrelevantly, just travel to places that you did not intend them to. Or you could be multitasking internally. Perhaps some of you are doing it now. You are paying attention to what I'm saying. You're looking at the slides. You're listening to me. But you might be planning what you're going to have for lunch later, or dinner, who you're going to meet uh, in the afternoon. And so this constant interference keeps us from being present, directed on our goals. So given those limitations of our brain and our susceptibility to interference, what happens when you take your brain and you expose it to this? So <laughs> you're probably all familiar with most of these things. The last several decades have literally seen an explosion of the diversity and accessibility of electronic media and the devices that deliver it, many of which are portable. Probably most of you have a computer in your pockets right now that allows you to access this at any moment. What's even more profound is not the change in te technology, but historically, one media has replaced other medias. That's not what's happening now. Now, data shows, and I'm sure you're all aware of it, that people are using medias at the same time. Approximately 95% of people report using more than one form of media at a time, um, and that activity takes place almost 30% of your days. Children might probably have this even more so, although it's just beginning to be investigated now. Almost an obsessive media multitasking frenzy. We're almost uncomfortable when you're taken away from your ability to interact with technology in this way. Before I move forward, I want to say that I am a friend of technology. I am not anti-technology. I use all these wonderful toys as, much, as well as you do. Here I am working on this talk, and you can see I have two large computer monitors, email on the left side, cell phone and hand accepting texts, um, music playing in the background. This is how we all interact with our technology, at least to some degree. Some people up to six or more forms of media at any given time. Another thing that's changed are expectations. This constant access to communications, comput communications, uh, computers, data, has really changed societal exp expectations. Now, immediate responsiveness and continuous pr productivity are expected. How many of you are on vacation and check your email? It's a little dark in here, but I just see a lot of movement out there. So I'll take that as a, as a uh, resounding yes, right? So we know that our ability to disconnect, to really be present in what we're experiencing, is decreasing even when we're taking vacations, the break from all of this constant productivity. So we should ask the question, how do we function at all? Given those limitations and how we interact with technology, how are we capable of getting anything done? So I want to tell you about the process of cognitive control. Cognitive control is what allows us to function, at least to some degree, under these circumstances. How we perceive the world is not a passive process. Our environment just doesn't flood into our brains. It's sculpted and shaped by our attention. Two types of attention. One attention is external, stimulus-driven attention. It is the environment imposing itself upon how you perceive the world. If there's a flash of light, a loud sound, even if someone calls your name quietly behind you, you pay attention, you redirect your attention. Anything that's very salient or novel demands your attention and increases your perception of it. The other type of attention, that's also known as bottom-up attention, the environment coming in. The other type is internal goal-directed attention, what you're doing now. You're choosing to focus your cognitive resources on what you're hearing and what you're seeing. This is known as top-down attention, your goal-directed attention. All of your interactions with the environment involves this balance between these two forms of attention that are dictating your perception. And now we know from a lot of research, a lot of it from our lab also, is that this influence then goes on and influences what you remember, both in the short term and in the long term. So what happens when all of this interference that we're being exposed to now exceeds the capabilities of our cognitive control? Well, what we now realize is that there is a broad and deep influence. Safety, family, our social development, workplace, education, all of these things are affected. There's not nearly enough time in this talk to talk about these, since each one of these can have their own lecture associated with them, showing you how broad this issue is. What I'm going to talk to you a little about in detail is cognition, because this is what we study in our lab, specifically memory. There's a really beautiful quote by Samuel Johnson, um, uh, who was an author, a British author in the 1700s. He wasn't a psychologist, he wasn't a neuroscientist, but he was incredibly insightful. He said something that uh, was, really showed a profound awareness because there was no data on this at the time. 
What he said is that the true art of memory is the art of attention. That no man will read with much advantage who is not able at pleasure to evacuate his mind. That if the repositories of thought are already full, what can they receive? And if the mind is employed on the past or the future, the book will be held before the eyes in vain. I mean, there is a full career of research studies here. We're slowly working our way through these to show what is going on in the brain that leads to this and how true is this to our, to our behavior. So I figure the easiest way to do this is to have you perform one of our experiments right now so you can get an idea of what we do. And while we do this, we record brain activity, so you're going to do a less demanding uh, uh, version of this where you're not shoved inside one of our scanners. But uh, what, what I'm going to have you do now is remember a face. This is a very simple experiment. One face is going to come up. It's going to come up pretty quickly, so be ready for it. And then a period of time is going to pass, around seven seconds. It's going to be an X on the screen. And you should be remembering this face. It's just one face. Then another face will come up. And your job would be to say, yes, that's the face I saw. No, that's a new face. OK? You ready to give it a shot? No, the answer is no. Now, if any of you are thinking yes, do not be nervous. There's no reason to make a <laughs> clinic appointment right now. It takes some practice to get used to this. People don't always get 100%. I'm going to have you do another version of this experiment. It's the same thing. See a face. After a period of time, another face will come up, and you have to see if it matches. But in this experiment, another face will pop up in the middle. And for that face, you have to make a decision. Is it a male over 20? And then go back to the business of remembering that first face. Does that make sense? Just remember one face and make a decision on the middle face. Pretty simple. Give it a shot. It was the same face. So did this seem a little harder to you? It is a little harder. So if you, if you study even healthy 20 and 30 year olds, you see that the performance diminishes when you introduce that second task, even though it's not a very hard experiment. Not only that, but if you introduce a face in the middle that's totally irrelevant, your performance also drops. Very subtle, but consistently. If you happen to be older than 60, your performance drops even more from the distraction and even more so from the interruption. So we see that there's an exaggerated effect with age of this impact that's even there in 20 and 30 year olds. We're now looking at how this type of distraction and interruptions might affect your long-term memory. So we did an experiment where we showed our participants a series of 168 pictures that had different numbers of objects. So what you're seeing here are three crowns, four couches, that's four vacuum cleaners, although they look at, like Statue of Liberties every time I look at that slide. But you see all these pictures, and then after an hour, you go inside our MRI scanner so we could see what's happening in your brain, and you hear these names, crown. And when you hear crown, you have to press the button on how many you remember seeing. Here the correct answer would be three. Or it might be new, maybe we never showed you that one before. The interesting thing is that we look at what happens to your memory when your eyes are shut, when your eyes are open looking at a gray screen, and when your eyes are open looking at a busy visual picture. And what we found is that the detailed quality, your recollection of those details decline just by having your eyes open looking at a picture, which is basically what you do all day long. Just that very simple stimulus that you have nothing to do besides remember declines just by having your eyes open. Later, you should do this experiment. Go up to a significant other or a friend, look them in the eyes, and ask them to tell you with some detail what they had for dinner last night. Almost invariably, what you'll see is that they look away from you. What we think is going on from looking at the brain data are that people are looking for a quiet place in their environment to recreate this memory. Just the mere fact of looking at your face is too distracting to do this at a high level. <laughs> Nothing personal. We did another experiment where it was basically the same, but now it was done in silence, or we went into a restaurant and we, cha we, we taped the normal chatter that occurs in a restaurant, and we found the same decline in memory. So the point of this is not that you should walk around with blindfolds on and earplugs in, right? The point is to show you how exquisitely sensitive 
our memory is, even to the normal environmental stimulation that we cannot escape. So you can imagine when you layer upon all the normal complexity that exists in our environment. But we do this, the reason we make such simple experiments is that we're recording brain activity with these tools, functional MRI, that lets us look at blood flow correlates of neural activity, and lets us see where in the brain events are occurring, as well as EEG, in which we're looking at electrical signatures of neural activity, when we can see when events are occurring. And we do these tools to understand what happens in our brain when we have interference and how it diminishes our abilities. I'm just gonna summarize this with a couple of cartoons, data from our lab and data from so many labs to give you sort of the latest understanding about what's going on. This is your brain. The front part is over here on this side. And what we see is that the prefrontal cortex, the prefrontal cortex is the part of our brain that makes us most human. It's the part that's evolved the most. It's the part that develops the latest. It's the part that's involved in this cognitive control. And when you're confronted with distraction, it acts as a bouncer. It's saying, what information is on the guest list? And through its connectivity in a network with visual parts of the brain, which are in the back, it controls what information gets in. You could see this is a very busy nightclub, but in your visual cortex, there's really only room for six things or even less at a time, depending on how complicated they are. When information gets in that's not on the guest list, you have a cost. Your performance drops. This is what changes as we get older. Our filter, our ability to block out information decreases, and the degree that it decreases directly correlates with our inability to remember the things that we're trying to remember, our goals. What happens in, the in, in terms of multitasking? Once again, the prefrontal cortex is in charge, but here it's acting as a flight controller. It's determining what information is the priority right now. And through its connections with the back of the brain, it's making decisions. So if, if you are crazy enough to be riding a bike through Manhattan next to a cab texting, you have a lot of decisions to make. <laughs> so maybe the first decision is to focus on the traffic. And then you think that somehow it's safe enough to now continue your text message. And so you do that. But what you don't do is this. You don't split those decisions. The prefrontal cortex has what's known as a central bottleneck. And so what you do is switch. Your prefrontal cortex switches between tasks, even though it feels like you're doing more than one thing. This is what has led to this being referred to as the myth of multitasking, that you're not really doing more than one thing unless they become very automated, gum chewing, walking, although even those have, have been found to have some interference with each other, believe it or not. <laughs> with each switch, there's a time delay, and this leads to a cost and an impact on performance. You do not do two things as well as you do one thing if you switch back and forth between them, and this gets worse as you get older. We just had a paper published last week that shows that as you get older, this switching, the letting go, the disengaging, and the re-engaging becomes slower, and this creates the interference in your memory. Why do we do it? We get the impression, and we have lots of data now, that this is negative on our performance. There's not a lot of data for this. Some of this is anecdotal and just based on my impressions, but it's a reasonable place to start. Multitasking. We have the sense that it gives us flexibility, fresh perspective, increased variety. It enables us to use our downtime productively. But probably the most salient aspect is that it's just more fun. We are novelty-seeking creatures. It's a very strong part of our evolution to seek out new. It stimulates the dopamine system, the reward system. There's no doubt that one chunk of time in which you're multitasking has more novelty than the same period of time in unitasking. And so we probably seek it out. It has even been the question that maybe it's even addicting at a certain level where you are constantly being uh, sort of pressured to get back into a new task once you become used to it. How about distraction? It's a little more complicated. Why do people go into noisy coffee shops to read and to work? Does anyone do that in this room? Right? It's very common. You usually know which type of person you are. So it's something that's interesting, something that we're exploring. All of this we're exploring in our lab now to understand the driving force of this and are there possible benefits? So what can be done about this, right? It's just too dreary to say all these negative things and then to walk off the stage. So <laughs> we don't have all the answers, but I can tell you that it seems that there are two paths, at least to me. We could change our behavior, or we could change our brains. <laughs> Not necessarily in this scary way that I'm depicting over here, but in a positive way. So our behavior. So we could change our behavior because someone forces us to, right? They say, it is too dangerous to talk on the phone 
or to text while driving. So we're not going to let you do that anymore. We'll give you a ticket if you do that. But there are other ways we could change our behavior on things that are less dangerous to society. So we could make decisions. Just because we have all this wonderful technology does not mean we have to use it all at exactly the same time. Right? We get to make decisions based upon what we now understand about how this interaction with technology and with ourselves changes our behavior. So I'm going to tell you what I, I do. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm going to tell you that since I researched this, I felt that I needed to make some decisions about my own behavior. And this is what I decided. When I'm working on something that's very important, something that demands high quality, especially something that's time sensitive, I do one thing at a time, singular attention. I quit my email. It's just too distracting if my email's there and I know messages are coming in. I turn off my phone. I close my door. I do one thing, and I find it quite enjoyable. I actually had stopped doing that for quite a while. But I don't do this all the time. There are as many things in my day that are very boring that I know have to get done, that I know if I tried to do one thing at a time, I would never finish it. So I might set aside three hours of just intense multitasking. The more I'm switching, the better. It just keeps it moving along. So it's not a message that technology is bad, that don't do this. It's just the point that decisions need to be made when we interact and our environment changes. It's happened many times in the past. This is just another example that we have to learn how to deal with better. Changing our brains. Our brains are capable of a tremendous degree of plasticity. That means it adapts and modifies to stimuli from the environment. And we now know that this is not just when you're a child. This occurs throughout your entire life. We are looking at exercises. There's a video game that we developed in our lab to see if we can strengthen these abilities through practice. So in this case, it's a car driving game, and you're interacting with the road, and there are signs coming up, and sometimes they're irrelevant, and sometimes they're relevant, and you're pressing buttons, and you're moving, and you're challenging yourself in an adaptive way, in a way that's fun. But what's interesting about this video game is that it was designed to be played in our lab while recording brain activity and seeing what's going on in your brain while you interact with all this type of interference. Then what we do, and we have a study going on now with healthy older adults, they take home a laptop and they play this game at home. And while they play it, their behavioral performance data downloads to their computer and downloads straight from Dropbox right into our lab. Almost in real time, we can get their brain data, while, uh, their behavioral data while they're playing at home. Then they come into the lab and we look, what has changed in their brain to enable them to function at a higher level, which is what we're seeing, that brains are capable of plasticity. We're now looking at wireless EEG Bluetooth headsets that allow us to have our older participants put these on at home and record their brain activity so we could move our lab outside of our laboratory into people's homes and record what are the changes in the brain that lead to this higher ability with practice. And then they could come back in the lab and we could use fMRI to look at the changes in networks. So I think it's an exciting time where we're learning more about how our brains can adapt to this. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention and, of course, your lack of attention to other things. Thank you.